soul, chapter 6 and 7. At times he seems to favor the former, but as one reads through the manuscript, one doubts it. His obvious preference for mysticism, the divided self, spectacular conversion stories. Notice that in this manuscript there are no chapters on sobriety or reticence or prudence as the fruits of a reasonable religion. Don't misunderstand me. I am not suggesting that varieties of religious experience will not gain a considerable reading audience. Unfortunately, people do still buy this sort of thing. We hope, of course, that in our selection of titles to publish, we can gradually improve the level of refinement of the reading public. So do we want our imprint to supply a kind of nihil obstat to such a speculative and hazardous enterprise as this? Now, I has hesitated before employing the phrase nihil obstat, which, as you know, is used by the authorities of the Roman Church to give its approval to theological works that manage to conform to its medieval inclinations. I am pleased, though, that here at our distinguished publishing house, we have an analogous power, albeit for works of a very different tenor. But I fear we may fritter it away if we bestow it too lavishly on questionable, even flighty material such as this. Here are a few of the reasons why I think we should be exceedingly careful before we proceed with this volume. As we enter the 20th century, and as science and technology advance, as literacy and education spread, religion will certainly soon begin to fade from the public consciousness. Superstition and obscurantism, along with war and poverty and ignorance, thank heaven, so to speak, are headed for the proverbial dustbin of history in the 20th century. This book is a kind of last hurrah for an expiring enterprise. Parenthesis. By the way, that phrase, last hurrah, <laughs> has a catchy ring. <laughs> it might be useful as the title for some future book that we might publish. <laughs> Second, even if some kind of religion does survive in the 20th century, would it ever be the fervent experiential variety Professor James seems to favor? Surely the solid, reasonable, ethically sensitive Unitarianism with which we are favored here in New England, or something akin to it, would have a much better chance to be the dominant faith, if there is such a thing, 100 years from now, than does some heartfelt but emotionally excessive form of piety. Fortunately, we now seem to have left that sort of thing to the hootings of the frontier revivals and the sweaty excess of the storefront chapels. I am saddened to think that we here at our publishing house might inadvertently lend respectability to a retrieval of a species of religion that is more at home in a sweltering tent than in a whitewashed meeting house. Why, James even uses the term twice-born people. I can imagine even the Southern Baptists taking salacious pleasure when they learn that one of Harvard's learned savants appears ready for the sawdust trail. Third, I have no desire whatever to ruffle denominational feathers. But one does wonder at times why Professor James seems so enamored of Roman Catholic figures especially those of a more numinous bent, such as St. Teresa of Avila, St. Ignatius, St. John of the Cross. Indeed, on one rather startling page, Professor James previously appreciated for his careful craftsmanship in science, he informs us that this same St. Teresa, during one of her notorious flights of ecstasy, quote, was given to see and to understand in what wise the mother of God had been assumed into her place in heaven. Professor James can't seem to get enough of this sort of thing. Strangely, in one of his few references to a New England minister, the Reverend William Ellery Channing, 
he devotes a page to describing with obvious appreciation how that minister's ascetic habits were so much like those of an anchorite. I have one more point which I hesitate to mention, and I hope it goes no further, but it does occur to me that Professor James is, after all, the offspring of a preacher in what some thoughtful observers do not hesitate to label a cult, Swedenborgianism. Now, I would not myself use that term, especially since I have not made a thorough study of Emanuel Swedenborg, but as most people know, Mr. Swedenborg claimed to have zoomed through the many levels of heaven and reports them in great detail and at great length. Again, I am not at all suggesting that the sins of the fathers are necessarily visited on the children. But lineage does, after all, matter, especially in our region of the country. <laughs> and is, it is clear that we cannot grasp Professor James's curious new fascination unless we understand something of his pedigree. Now, having said all this, I suppose I must very reluctantly concede that we have little choice but to publish these sad symptoms of a great scholar gone astray. Publishing this book indeed seems untimely at the dawn of this new and enlightened 20th century. But I suppose we must. Professor James does have a wide reputation, and his name on the cover will sell books, which will please our board of directors. I feel sure, however, that 100 years from now, the varieties of religious experience will long since have gone out of print. <laughs> Existing copies will be gathering dust in basement archives and that the book will be forgotten, even by those few individuals who, at that future date, might still be inclined to study such esoterica. <laughs> Brilliantly done, brilliantly done, all three of you. Um, I have a few questions, but I hope everybody will feel uh, entitled and, and um, challenged to cross-examine the advocates. Um, I'd just like to begin by noting, and I should have mentioned it before, that Steve Pinker has a red-hot bestseller on the lists as we speak called The Blank Slate, and it's all about um, human nature. I, I, um, I want to ask you a couple of things, Steve. For, first of all, um, Steve Pinker's book is a is a not difficult but complicated and important argument about wh where essential our essential qualities are formed, and the answer is much more in the genes than you you thought or than you you hoped as a parent. But um, uh, I guess I want to know your, your your whole field, Steve, has been language acquisition and these things. What where does Helen Keller come in to this argument? It's a complicated uh, case study. She is referred to in many of the, the textbooks and even some of the reference books on language acquisition. She was stricken with her disease um, at the age of 17 months, uh, which is uh, at an age where uh, many children will have already acquired several dozen words and also often begin to combine them in, in little baby sentences like uh, hi doggy uh, and, or more milk. So it wasn't as if she had to learn uh, language at the age of six from scratch. She said that she continued in her memoir, as best as she could remember it, she said she continued to um, ar articulate a, a few words, in including water, all the way through. So what she describes as a revelation was also in part a, a kind of re reawakening, something that was mm -hmm. already present. Um, it's, uh, she also is, is an unusual case in that very few um, deaf people uh, learn to read and write uh, English. Uh, the, or at least at the uh, adult level, let alone the high literary level that Helen Keller achieved. The, the typical reading achievement of a, of a deaf person in English is at a fourth grade level. And uh, whereas Helen Keller, who was both deaf and blind, often was send, sent me to the dictionary to look up some of the words that, that uh, she used. So it's a, she's by any standards a remarkable woman. Um, and. Uh, 
therefore, as a source of lessons about how language acquisition proceeds, um, it, it's hard to draw scientific generalizations from her. And what about the human, the human nature of the woman? Well, what I found interesting was the fact that um, contrary to the view that we inherited from British empiricists that there's nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses, here is a woman whose sensory experience was uh, just remarkably deprived. I mean, we, you could imagine not being able to see and making up for it with hearing or not being able to hear and making up for it with sight. Uh, she had neither one. And nonetheless, the, uh, even putting aside her style and her articulateness, the sheer uh, richness of the content that she described. The, uh, she described uh, uh, spatial arrangements and the uh, fragrances and textures and visual appearances that were described to her. She used words that were uh, rich in visual and auditory imagery. Uh, she had a, clearly an acute understanding of other people and of abstract ideas. I mentioned her, her pacifism and her socialism. She wrote a, uh, an eloquent eulogy to Lenin, which uh, I think we now have a, perhaps a more uh, a darker view of, but at the time uh, she praised his noble experiment. Um, and um, so what it, what it uh, at least it tells me is that the human mind uh, has the ability to conceptualize uh, rich, multidimensional reality, that the senses are kind of just peripheral systems, you know, input-output drivers but that the real richness of the mind doesn't come from uh, patterns abstracted from sensory experience, but from a, um, a complex set of ways of construing the world that were present in her, and it simply needed this alternative channel to uh, get in. Erica, I, I'm not sure how to get Owen Wister into the, this um, conversation between William James and, um, or, or Harvey and Steve. Uh, Harvey, that's a brilliant sort of, um, uh, sort of counter-selling argument you've put f forward. Um, and I'd love somehow for you and Steve to join the issue, and it's a very serious one, uh, including the matter of human nature. Uh, the, the, in, at the back of Steve's book on the blank slate is a fascinating and expandable list of the universal human qualities, including, you know, fear of snakes and... Uh, 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 copulation in private and many, many other aspects of language. There are nouns and verbs the world around. Um, but there's also worship and music in worship and theater and drama in worship. All of these things that James's book was about validating. And um, I'd love you to argue that point, the two of you. In a certain way, um, Harvey, your brief against the if, James. I, if I argue it with guns, then I'll hey, that, we'll, it, we'll, right? there'll be a shootout. There'll be a shootout. Who can draw fastest? Um, draw, partner. <laughs> when you call me that smile. Uh, um, but your case against James is certain, in a certain way something that um, uh, Steve might make, and I'd love to. I'd love to, you to mix it up. Well, I, I hope every, everybody noticed that this was a kind of a reversal of what I. Really should have been saying here. I thought I'd have a little fun tonight by doing it this way, because this uh, assistant editor, of course, has been proved entirely and completely wrong. Uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, rather than languishing in, in the in dust in the archive, uh, this book has become a classic. It is indeed still in print. It is still studied and appreciated by large numbers of people. It was uh, prescient in that it saw uh, the movement of religion, which is always changing, into a more experiential and, uh, and uh, expressionist vein, rather than in the strictly institutional packaging of religion. It, uh, it legitimated a kind of interest in the mystical uh, vein in religion at a time when this was not very popular around Boston, uh, and so on. It was it was a it was a uh, phenomenally far-sighted uh, book by a, a by a reputed physiologist and psychologist who was pleading with his fellow um, scientists to to try to set aside their uh, their uh, immediate judgmental atti attitude toward religion and look at the impact it had on people's lives and then 
do whatever speculation they want about where this was coming from. But look, look first about what's happening with human beings uh, that we call religion. Well, exactly. It was dead on about sort of where the people were going, 90 plus percent, whatever, believe in God and all that stuff. But it was quite wrong about where this, his own science of psychology was going. How, how can that be, Steve? The, um, or or, or, or how, do they, how do the psychologists answer for this? It, it's true that um, for most of the 20th century, and still to a large extent, psychology insists on ignoring the most interesting aspects of human behavior, the things that everyone, <laughs> the entire world, and this is, they're often proud of it, that um, what a typical first lecture in introductory psychology does is disabuse the student of the notion that they're going to learn all of the um, interesting aspects of human behavior in that course. Forget things like uh, you know, religion and love and sex and jealousy and status and work and play and eating and Wall disgust fiction, and so on. Huh? Yeah, right. Indeed. And uh, instead, you're going to be studying you know, attention and attitude formation and short-term memory and so on. I think recent, only recently has that begun to change, perhaps in the last 10 years, thanks in large part to evolutionary psychology, which I think has become popular not so much because of the evolution part, but because of the psychology part, because it, it actually reintroduced all of these interesting topics, including religion, to uh, the, the uh, uh, discipline of psychology. And there have been, in, just in the last four or five years, um, uh, the, uh, a number of books on the psychology of religion after, indeed, a, 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 almost a century of neglect. Mm -hmm. uh, picking up where William James left off, there's an excellent book by Pascal Boyer called Religion Explained, with a, a modest title, which I even blurbed uh, as the best book on religion since the varieties of religious experience, uh, mm -hmm. one of the only books on the psychology of religion. And there are a couple of other, uh, others in the pipeline. But indeed, this, it, was a, I it was a prescient book and only recently has this subject been revived. See, I, I want to digress, but also just be a little bit provocative. It seems to me, even in your own book, um, your definitions of psychology um, have a hard time coping with that human reality that appears in the appendix of universal qualities and that William James was determined to, to find a place for. A, a, a long digression to the Polish poet Czesław Milos, this is just something I came across recently, but it quite touched me, and I think it's on the point. It's a, it's a poem called On Prayer. And it goes like this, most of it. You ask me how to pray to someone who is not. All I know is that prayer cons constructs a velvet bridge, and walking it we are aloft, as on a springboard, above landscapes the color of ripe gold, transformed by a magic stopping of the sun. Notice, I say we. There, everyone separately feels compassion for others entangled in the flesh and knows that if there is no other shore, we will walk that aerial bridge all the same. It seems to me that the, the James book, in a certain way, is all about that aerial bridge, too, and saying this is a sort of a mystery space, but it's, it's certainly in us, and let's Let's work at it. Um, it strikes me still that the psychologists uh, have a harder time working in that space that they do in all those other mystery spaces of the human universals. And uh, what's to be done about it? Or am I completely wrong? Well, the, the, what makes the psychology of religion such an interesting topic to, to James and to contemporary evolutionary psychologists is that it, um, it's unlike other parts of the mind that have a straightforward uh, Darwinian explanation. And James himself was a perhaps the first evolutionary psychologist. He tried to make the notion of human instinct respectable and believed that many mental functions could be understood in terms of their function, which uh, in Darwinian terms would ultimately be uh, survival and reproduction. But um, religion doesn't seem to easily fit into that scheme the way, say, color vision or thirst or language might, in that there's no clear way in which say, the hallmarks of religion all over the world, such as a belief that you could divine the future from um, physical signs in the present, or an appeal to a, a world of unobservable spirits and mind-like entities, or the idea that uh, fortune and misfortune uh, can be explained and even 
uh, uh, prevented by propitiating some uh, invisible mind-like uh, entity. None of these would seem, at first glance, to really act in the service of, of having more surviving babies. Um, <clears throat> and that's why uh, Boyer, and, and uh, I'm, I'm convinced by this, um, uh, argue that religion is not a mental module in the way that, say, thirst or color vision uh, might be, or short-term memory, but rather it arises from a complex interaction among many other parts of the mind that uh, were not specifically selected for religious belief, such as the um, oh, curiosity, the uh, desire to know where things uh, come from, uh, the ability to conceive of other people as having minds sep that are separate from their body and therefore by extension, the ability of spirits and, and minds to exist separately from bodies. Um, the desperate desire for certain outcomes, such as recovery from illness or success on the battlefield, and when ordinary measures of, of success fall short, the temptation is to appeal to some world of wonder that exists in the, in the um, a non-material uh, dimension. And empirical observations, such as uh, dreams and death and trances, uh, which James made much of, in which it seems even to a uh, cold-eyed empiricist that there exists this thing called mind that is separate from, from the body. The mere fact that when we dream, for example, some part of us seems to be up and about in the world, uh, but our body has been in bed the whole time or in a, uh, a, a trance. And these kinds of empirical observations, which uh, until very recently no one had any reason to um, explain in terms of the neurophysiology of the brain would seem to be prima facie evidence for this, uh, for the separate spiritual world that we couldn't perceive with our, our uh, five senses. So those are some of the ideas that psychologists are using now to try to grapple with why religion is a human universal and indeed has these recurring um, uh, beliefs and belief systems. How would you want to respond? I have a question, Erica. Can I just say one thing about this? Yeah, please. This? Shelley said very famously that poets are the uh, unacknowledged legislators of the mind. And William Empson, a con more contemporary poet, had a wonderful gloss on that, which is that poets are the legislature legislators of the unacknowledged mind, mm -hmm. um, which is that aerial precipice you're talking about. You know, it's the, it's the place you can't get to except through one imagination touching another imagination. But it's exactly the point I wanted to ask you, Erica, <clears throat> in following up on your, on your notion, your celebration of fiction as fiction. Um, one of the wonderful things about Steve Pinker's book is, is the evidence of, uh, that the fiction writers always get there first, and even uh, um, the most modern of, of uh, scientific psychologists are forever uh, leaning on Brothers Karamazov or Homer, much less Shakespeare, much less Emily Dickinson, and in a marvelous piece toward the end of Steve's book, um, John Updike. So that we, we know... <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. In terms of, in terms of a, a, a sort of um, almost bumper sticker condensation of a, of a theory of human nature, um, I wondered if you'd want to make the, <clears throat> just the case that, and in, can you do it with Owen Wister, that um, the novelists, um, that's the way to go, that the novelists, like the poets, are not just the legislators, but they're the well, there are another uh, faculty. think of the people, I mean, I think for, if we think about what, Lo Owen, Lis what Owen Lis Wister <laughs> anticipated in terms of popular culture, not so much in terms of novels, but, you know, every Western hero you can think of when the movie came out in 1929, Gary Cooper played the Virginian and all the, you know, uh, John Wayne, the, you know, even the, that hero in the Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear, you know, he's a, he's an Owen Wiston, Wister character. Uh, I think that the, the sense in which the cowboy still pervades our popular um, imaginations, mm. there was an article in the, uh, uh, an editorial of Derek Jackson's a few days ago in the Globe in which he describes the Bush boys just rode into town and the you know streets are still smoking. 
I mean, you know, it's... Uh, Ronald Reagan made a pretty good career right, of it, yeah. Right, right. And, and, they, and, you know, one of the things Bush said in his inaugural speech was, you know, that he was going to bring civility back, remember? To so we... Does this come for or against Owen Wister? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, had don't. A, I had a question I wanted to put to Erica, too, uh, but I wanted to respond to the wonderful poem first by uh, uh, Milos, uh, which I think is... A, a, a beautiful statement. There's only one small word in it that would differentiate him from William James, and that's the word we. At some point he says, we, this is a we. Remember that, uh, the line you just read? Yep. Uh, if there is a legitimate criticism of James, he had very little sense for the culturally embedded nature of religion or of the uh, institutional uh, Propri uh, patronage of religion. He, he, was, he was a real individualist, and that's why he liked mystics. That's why he loved mystics who didn't seem to him to be related to institutional or traditional or culturally uh, embedded religion, even though they were. Uh, 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 Teresa and Ignatius and all the rest were, had a vast store of symbols and stories to draw on. Uh, now, he was also, he was, he, he was uninstitutional, he was also un, or certainly non- Orthodox either. There was, there's no doctrine oh, no. here. This is all. This is all in the, in the body. In the. I, I think it was. It was probably healthy for him to grow up in this. Slightly weird church, the Swedenborgians. I hope I'm not offending anybody here. <laughs> who were viewed by almost everybody as just a little odd, a little on the edge, a very unorthodox and very strange. But he. He was strange, forgive me, Steve, but he was, he was stranger even than, than you suggested. Uh, I owe it to that marvelous book, uh, The Metaphysical Club, that when he was dying and, and Brother Henry came to his house, they agreed that Henry would stay for six weeks after he died in case he could get through with the message. Um, he, was, he was way out there in terms of drugs and in terms of uh, just wacky modern thinking across the board. We need more like that. Don't Amen. We? Could, could, could I ask Erica my question now? Sorry? Could I ask Erica the question? You may. Uh, one, one of the things I'm terribly interested in getting your view of, as I try to teach courses in religion and so on to Harvard undergraduates is, and others, is when I explain to them that something in the Bible is a story and not history, mm -hmm. they suddenly feel that they want to give up on everything. Yeah. Only a story. Why do people say only a story? They want to give up because it's, uh, it's not, not, history worth, not or a it's worthwhile not, pursuit. It's not a worthwhile. Uh, how can you possibly learn anything or be inspired by anything or uh, be touched by anything if it looks like history, but it really isn't history? Wow. It's an interesting question to Only ask me. Only a story. I was forbidden to go to church by my parents who didn't believe in the church, but who read us the Bible all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? For the stories. For the stories. For the yeah, stories. Yeah. Exactly. For the stories. Uh, what can you say? Do they not believe that, that, um, that taking that leap away from the real, from the given, from oneself is, is worth taking? I, I think something has made them more literal minded and, and less capable of metaphor, poetry, symbol, story over the last couple generations so that uh, they have to be somehow lured into an appreciation of the story quality, which is absolutely central mm. to what religions have been about through all the years of, mm. of, of, of religious history. They're, they're about stories. They're conveyed through stories. Do they hear them. the voices? I mean, do they hear things read out loud? Because I, I think so much of a story ah, yeah. coming to you is, is through voice, you know, through the through the sound of another person organizing these words in a way that you would never choose to organize yeah, them. Yeah, you know, come to think of it, that's true. When I read something out loud, uh, yeah. uh, some, some part of the Bible or something, I notice a kind of a hushed attention, at least yeah. while I'm reading yeah. that. Read out uh, loud more. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> read out loud more. I think it's the answer but, to almost everything. <laughs> makes it a very valuable evening for me. <laughs> Thank you. Harvey, or, and this applies to all of you, but how do you introduce people to the notion that uh, we're looking for the, the truth of something, of a, of a difficult uh, definition that has almost nothing to do with whether something happened or not? Well, I guess I'll, I'll say something in defense of the 
<coughs> distinction between stories and, and fact. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, it does make a difference, and I'm actually heartened that students really care about the difference, which is not that they shouldn't uh, appreciate stories for what they can tell us, but um, I think, I mean, I would say that the main problem in the, in the world today is uh, a failure to distinguish stories from reality, and a, what, an example that's recently been in the news is the um, uh, Egyptian TV series depicting the protocols of the elders of Zion uh, as if it were fact and when the filmmaker was uh, challenged. This is, of course, the notorious anti-Semitic forgery by the Tsar's uh, secret police, which is circulated in much of the uh, Islamic world as if it were uh, valid and which is now being broadcast on uh, uh, Egyptian TV during the period in which everyone is at home watching television. The filmmaker said, well, it really doesn't matter whether it's uh, real or not. I mean, it, if it wasn't real, it could have been real. Well, I think most of us are, are kind of horrified by that. Mm -hmm. It makes all the difference in the world uh, that, it is, that it is just a story, a story written for a, a uh, nefarious purpose and is not factual. So um, I'm going to, uh, I guess, make a, a complimentary point, not that, that we shouldn't pay attention to stories, but that if students care about the difference, I consider that to oh, be no, a good no, thing. I, the, uh, my point was that they do care about the difference, but it's when they discover that something is a story and not facts, they dismiss it as right. being valueless, it's not without okay. value. I, I was once teaching a class at um, MCI Norfolk. I don't teach it the places that they teach, <laughs> <laughs> except I do teach one course at MIT. But, um, and I was reading from a book, and one of the prisoners, he'd been there a long time. He looked like a member of the Winter Hill Gang. And um, he said to me when I was done, OK, Erica, so what's real, and what did you make up? And I said, I sometimes make things up in order to get across my idea of the real. All writers do. And he thought for a minute and said, that's exactly what I'm in here for. <laughs> so, so I'm not at all advocating that we confuse the real and the, and the made up, but the sensuous world is a way of entering the sensuous world is a way of entering the world of fact and the world of history and the world of politics and, and the therefore world of the psychology. real world it's yeah. a way of entering the real world exactly exactly mm. so uh it's all um they feed each other to my mind well, just a random observation is that Helen Keller was quite sympathetic to, to the uh, Swedenborg Church. I'm not oh, sure she if she was. was actually a Swedenborgian, but uh, she was very interested in the movement. Mm -hmm. we, we've closed the circle. It was, it was yes, all one was, great big conspiracy. Can I ask uh, Harvey a question? May I ask Harvey? Sorry? Uh, where did James find all these people? When he, when he says, oh, a friend of mine gives me this experience, or I've heard about this experience, where are, where are these? Who are these people? How does he know them? <laughs> he probably did not meet them at the Harvard Faculty Club. <laughs> uh, but he was a wide-ranging person who, who, uh -huh. who walked around and met a lot of people and talked with a lot of people, read very widely. Uh, and frankly, Eric, I think occasionally he makes it up. Oh, the Mike <laughs> Barnacle yeah, problem. Yeah, son of a little <laughs> he may have read it somewhere yeah. and then said a friend of mine said this, or he might have heard it. I, 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 I suspect. It's the, it's the old New Yorker talk of the tantric. A friend writes. A friend uh, writes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, th there are going to be questions, comments, brickbats, or objections in this wise audience. Uh, we have, we're talking about an autobiography, a novel, and a sort of prophetic essay, long, infinitely long essay on religion. Um, before you cast your votes, before you commit yourself, who would like to sort of tip the scales one way or the other? For Henry James, for Owen Wister. William James. Against Helen Keller, as you like, please. Uh, and and you're, you're asked to go to the microphone at the side, on this side too. Don't believe the hype. Speak for yourself here about these three books. I actually have a question for all three of you, but uh, Dr. Pinker and Dr. Cox will probably have most to say about it. Uh, modern researchers like Dr. K. Jameson posit that William James had manic depression. In fact, it ran in his family. And I think Henry did too, and maybe Alice and his father. Uh, could you address, please, both the psychological and religious influence the manic experience must have had on James's interest 
in the mystical and also what place mania might have had in the mystics experience in general. Uh, let me just say a sentence or two about that. Uh, James says very early in Varieties of Religious Experience that uh, indeed many of the people he refers to and quotes may be pathological. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and even uh, uses some of that terminology. But, he, but then he says, because this is a kind of uh, psychological pathology, does that excuse us from, from determining about what, what they say has some truth? That's a very nice step to take, you see. And he's pleading with people not to be dismissive entirely of people who seem to have, psycho or may even have, classifiable psychological conditions and, and therefore not believe anything they say or not take it seriously at all. He's also, as you know, very suspicious of classifying things. As soon, he says, the, the biggest problem with science is we are obsessed with classification. As soon as we see a person or a thing, we want to classify it with everything else, and that robs it of a certain kind of uh, individuality and the impact it can make as an individual thing. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if we can, um, we can or should diagnose people long after they're, they're dead, but um, <laughs> it is, it's not implausible that, uh, that James could have um, had some of the symptoms of bipolar disorder. I mean, the, some, some people who have it uh, have these um, sort of ecstatic and um, exhilarating uh, bouts of creativity and, and energy in the manic phase of, of a bipolar disorder. Uh, and indeed, some um, uh, are wistful about controlling it by medication because they don't miss the depressive episodes, but they sometimes do miss the manic episodes. Hmm. And uh, it's conceivable that, that applied to James, although we can, I don't think we can know. If I may say, uh, Harvey, picking up on your point, it, it, I kept thinking when he, when he talks about um, sort of the basic nut, nut cases that have been religiously valuable, I kept thinking of Dostoevsky, who was epileptic, was bipolar, who wouldn't have taken uh, the drug if he could have. He always, I mean, it comes up many times in Dostoevsky's work that that the the terrible agony of the post-epileptic crash uh, was, was, it was worth it to take that for the high of the, of that sort of beatific moment beforehand. Um, I'd never, I, I, I'd never thought of William James even being close to that level of, of um, strangeness but he certainly felt that there was much good came from it. Please. I'd just like to say that I came here thinking that I would vote for the William James book, uh, primarily because of the influence his work has had in open-mindedness and creativity and psychology and philosophy. But I am kind of troubled that uh, in a work that some people are looking to him as a, a philosopher and, and as a scientist, that he would have made up uh, or, or, or said things happened in his first hand, or his direct knowledge, that perhaps were not. So that sort of makes me have a second thought I'd just like to register about whether I'm going to vote for um, William James' uh, book. Now, let me see if I can win your vote back here. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have no proof whatever that uh, William James uh, attributes things other, other, that, that to uh, other than people that he actually heard them from. Uh, this suspicion has come up in my mind now and then, since he's such a superb stylist. He's going along and talking about things, and, and uh, that might have slipped in. But uh, let, me, let me get him off the hook here. This is, this is, uh, this is my casual reading, and, it, and I may be accusing somebody of something he didn't do. And I hope he forgives me, wherever he may be. <laughs> do we want to make an argument about style, and just prose style here? Does anybody want to comment on, uh, you have, Glancingly, but um, is, there a, is there a just plain prose winner here? They're all they're pretty all bloody good. They're all, yeah. they're all beautiful. Certainly, uh, Helen Keller's style is not a style that very many people would write in anymore. Um, I, think it, I think she was a, a gifted stylist, but it is absolutely a, uh, a century-old style. It is more uh, grandiloquent. Uh, more emotionally laden than uh, a memoir would be these days. And I, for me, it's actually an interesting historical document on how 
public uh, prose has changed, that now you know, we all appreciate the, the lean, muscular prose. Uh, and her prose was not lean or muscular, <laughs> uh, but it was excellent. And it, it does show, I think, how, how standards have changed. But it, it certainly is beautifully crafted. Well, I haven't read Virginia, and I haven't read Helen Keller's autobiography. So it's sort of classless of me to say that I'm going to vote for William James' variety of religious experience. But I think I'm going to say why. Um, what, what moved me so much about that book, and, and it truly in a way changed my life, is that it helped me redefine the word religion from the, from the um, series of grand answers to the series of grand questions that a religious person embraces. Um, I spend most of my life in Jerusalem now, the home of the three great religions. <laughs> and I can tell you, uh, the experience has become largely sickening. Um, and it's sickening partly because of the overwhelming quality of that word, we, which I think William James helped disabuse us of when he um, explored religion as a tremendously personal conception of oneself going to one's own grave. I mean, we don't go to the grave. We, I may recognize that you're also going, but I'm going to my own, and I'm living life in my own shoes. And the fact that I have Varieties of religious experience in my own life have largely to do with my fate as a human being walking the planet myself and going to my own grave myself. And James, I think, unfortunately failed. I mean, I, 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 I believe that book was meant to be a tremendously radical prod to redefine a word. And he's largely failed. Uh, I think we still fail to acknowledge that the questions that make religious experience necessary are fundamentally personal questions and require everyone to spend their life searching for answers they know in advance they're never going to find. But I'd welcome responses, but I also want to, uh, is that not a, um an argument that uh, there's a healing power left in this, this idea and in this book if people would only confront it. In other words, to fight the institutional, to fight the dogmatic, fight the doctrinaire, fight the orthodox in the name of uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, is in our, in our individual and our species nature. Uh, Harvey, Steve, No, I, I, I think that was a very uh, eloquent defense. Maybe this gentleman should have been invited to be the uh, <laughs> uh, presenter here. Uh, uh, I, I think that even though, let me just differ a little bit. Even when I go to my own grave, I go uh, aware of where I've come from, what has formed me in my consciousness, what I either hope for or don't hope for at that moment. All of this is a gift that's come to me, some of it's a curse, uh, from outside of myself, from traditions, stories, things that I've been a part of that I have internalized. Uh, so I don't want to separate quite that cleanly uh, the personal individual from the tr traditional uh, corporate uh, side of it. I think they're much more closely intertwined. And uh, I think at, his, at the moment he wrote, he was making a very strong and very necessary case uh, for that. We, we are now at a stage in which the individualism of our culture in so many ways has gotten so excessive, I think, that the idea of a common good or a common goal or a common vision seems to have been lost sight of. Uh, so I, I want to uh, say a little bit of something for the other side there. Erica, Steve, or should we take one more question and declare victory or, or find who won? Please. I'd just like to say that although William James 
and Helen Keller are American marvels, and deservedly so, that Erica Funkhauser has raised Owen Wister in my uh, uneducated way, <laughs> over the top in the National Book Award. I've never read him, but you've made me want to. I had never read Owen Wister either before, before uh, this assignment. And uh, when I reported that to my family, both of my children looked at me and said, what? You've never read The Virginian? They'd had it read to them by their father when they were quite young. So, um, and I was downstairs doing the dishes and missed the whole thing. I don't know what happened, but. But uh, it's a terrific, terrific book to read to a 10, 11 year, 12 year old. It's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful read. You'll have fun and they'll have fun. What did you, what did you think of the movie, Erica? I, I didn't watch the movie. It is a movie. We will now proceed to the voting booth. Oh, one more question over here, sorry. M Mr. Lyden, may I have the privilege of the last question? You, you may, sir. Thank you. Uh, sure, house. Li like. Uh, <laughs> Like I'm sure many others, I'm just beginning today to recover from the deluge of 60-second television spots promoting various candidates. And uh, as I'm sort of weaning myself away from the experience of that, I'm hoping tonight that the three panelists can give us 60 seconds promoting their books as we go to the ballot box. 60 seconds only. This is a test. Well, if we're, if we're going to do it uh, according to the pattern of the recent campaigns, we should spend 60 seconds each trashing the other two. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Let's do that. That will be fun. Um, I know you trust, the order which you Do you really it. trust Erica Funkhauser? <laughs> <laughs> Harvey Cox will raise your taxes. <laughs> 60 seconds, These starting with... These two are both from Boston. <laughs> what can I say, you know? Owen Wister was from Philadelphia. <laughs> Harvey Cox, 60 seconds, starting on your end. Starting with me? Please. Oh, 60 seconds. Wow. <laughs> okay, I'll be serious now and not be the assistant editor <laughs> and, and say that... Uh, Without any kind of disparagement of the two books uh, also offered here, I, I, I think that we're in the presence, in varieties of religious experience, of a genuine classic that really belongs in the hundred or books, uh, hundred great books of the Western world. It's a book of that stature. It was a book that was not as appreciated when it first came out as it should have been because it was in fact so prescient, but has turned out to be so enormously. Uh, far-sighted and accurate, and also uh, to hear from someone that it actually changed your life is to me uh, more than I can uh, more than it, more than I could possibly add. So I, I hope you think this over carefully and be sure to vote. And I'm sure you'll do the right thing. <laughs> Erica. I agree with you completely. I, I agree with everything that Harvey said about um, the William James book. It's very very, very powerful, as is that Helen Keller book. These are just exquisitely written stories, all of them. The reason that you must read The Virginian and vote for it is because this is how Americans are perceived. It's actually a good version of how we're perceived, um, afraid of the bad version of how we're perceived. But the cowboy image, we are considered cowboys in most of the world. Our impetuousness, our willingness to ride into town, quickly do the work and get out. You know, I think that's why we need to pay attention to this image of uh, the cowboy and the Virginian is, is one of the most noble ones of, available. He's a good guy. He gets the girl in the end. His horse likes him. You know, every, I mean, it's, um, but he is us. Thank you. Well, Helen Keller's The Story of My Life uh, shows what a human being is capable of. It's a reflection of uh, the best of human nature, the gift of articulate speech, compassion for others, uh, determination. 
Uh, it's a beautifully crafted memoir, one that would that uh, does not wallow in in uh, self pity or sentimentality, even though it is uh, affecting, uh, despite itself. Uh, and it has made her uh, truly one of the most extraordinary people who who uh, have ever lived. And uh, this is truly one of the most extraordinary um, uh, documents about the life of a person uh, uh, in our species. Amen, and thank you, thank you all. Harvey Cox is a professor at Harvard's Divinity School. Erica Funkhauser teaches poetry at MIT, and Steven Pinker is a psychology professor at MIT. They took part in a panel discussion last November at the Boston Public Library, online at bpl.org. Monday is President's Day, and you're watching a three-day weekend of books on Book TV. Coming up at 3 p.m. Eastern, humorous Barbara Holland turns her eye toward American presidents in Hail to the Chiefs. Then traverse the history of stock market booms and busts with CNBC's Ron Insana, author of Trend Watching. Tonight on History on Book TV. Andrew Linklater examines Thomas Jefferson's role in creating the American system of measurement. After that, a foreign policy discussion with authors Walter Russell Mead, Paul Bluestein, Joseph Nye Jr., and Samantha Power. And at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, a book party for Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, author of Square Peg. Is Einstein's theory of special relativity wrong? Theoretical physicist Joao Magezu says yes in his new book, Faster Than the Speed of Light. He details his rejection of Einstein's theory today on Book TV. First, you'll watch as Pages Magazine editor Beth Ann Patrick interviews the author for an upcoming profile article. That'll be followed by a talk at the Hershorn Museum in Washington, D.C. Joao Magezu questions the foundation of modern physics beginning at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. It just became clear to me that Europeans were looking at the world and had a sense of what international order should be like uh, that was rather strikingly different from the American perspective. Tonight on C-SPAN's Book Notes, Robert Kagan on the future of U.S. foreign policy, of paradise and power, America versus Europe in the New World Order. Book Notes, one author, one book, one hour, every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Now here's best-selling author of three memoirs, Da Chen, describing his love for books and reading while growing up in poverty in rural China. I, I always want to be, I, I, I was an avid reader, but the problem with um, being an avid reader during this period in China was that there were no books out there to be read. So, uh, but there was hope. At the edge of our, of our small town, there was one former convict who had been released from the prison. He set up a book renting business, an underground practice. He has a store much like yours, the size here. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was, it was never, there was, there was not such a thing as a painted characters outside that says book renting business. He just rented this business. And you know where he got these books? He actually has stolen these books from uh, a prison where he had been locked, library. So when he left the prison, <laughs> he came home with a, with a bag full of books. And those were forbidden books. And um, soon he started his business. And every Saturday afternoon, if I happened to be in possession of one fin, which is like maybe a tenth of a, a cent here, that's all I need in a pocket. I make sure it didn't leap out of my pocket. And I ran to that little muddy house a bungalow, fetched through the whole bit. And I looked through the window to see if there's anyone there, and there's a book there that I love to read, and I give this friend to him. I would come with my friends, who would paste their notes against the window, wanting to come in with me. But one friend only allowed one person to come in, only allowed you to read that book once, under the watchful eyes of the owner. And my friends, one would say, go quick, go in there and read quickly so that you can come out and tell the story quickly. 
And the other guy would say, no, 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 go there slowly, go read slowly, so they can tell us every little details of the book from chapter one to last chapter. And, uh, and that is how we spent afternoons. And there were just books that I like to read over and over again. But soon these fans ran out and the guy will come over and tap on your shoulder and say, it's time for you to go now. Or you'll be forbidden, forbidden from come to, to come here next time. And, uh, and one day, even that was gone. Suddenly that place was tossed. And the whole renting, book renting business went up in the smoke. And I still remember that day standing near the uh, grim paddy, you know, rice field, watching this little house up in the smoke. I know part of that smoke came from the ashes of those books. And uh, that took away um, a lot from within me. General high school years, again, books were very rare to find. So um, I remember taking part in a, in a book copying um, process. One of our classmates uh, somehow got hold of a very, very good book. So uh, we said, well, we want to read that book, but then, you know, it's just the line is so long, you'll never get to him before he had to return the book to somebody else. So we organized 20 people to copy the 20 chapters. Uh, within a day or two, we have another book reproduced. The book reads very oddly because <laughs> with the misspellings and punctuations missing here and there in a hurry, boyish writing, uh, a very fine literature, literature got really mangled uh, <laughs> into some coarse story. But we enjoyed it so intensely, nonetheless. All we need is the plot. All we need is the ending of the story. What happened to the character? And those are the wonderful things. Wonderful things. And frankly, no matter how little a little a village you lived in, as long as you have words, you could fly. And reading is power. And that's why in one sentence in Colors of Mountain, I said that even though I was sitting on a small, tiny spot in Yellowstone, surrounded by golden rice fields, the world was within me because I read. And it is so good. Just a, not long ago, C-SPAN broadcast, C-SPAN, best channel, <laughs> broadcast, <laughs> broadcast a uh, uh, first lady, Laura Bush's um, uh, commemorating Mark Twain's uh, um, birthday, a publication of, of, of uh, Huckle Bear Finn. Um, and she brought together all those writers and editors to talk about importance of reading for the children and all that. And I say how lucky these people are. All the books waiting. My daughter goes to elementary school, public elementary school. Books lay there in the bookshelves, waiting, begging for her to read. All kinds of books, picture books, this and that. The books that can talk, the books can sing, and the books that can shout. And that is joy. And I hope that you know, American kids in appreciate that because that, that is just, you know, book is, is, is a simple thing, but I think it's just the most, most, most expensive luxury. Imagine people have to write it and then make them into a nice little book and then, and then you know, to hold it in your hand. You can sort of cuddle in a little bed, a rainy day outside, and you read. That's a luxury. A, a child in a poor country somewhere in Asia couldn't afford that. A, a child in Africa couldn't afford that. Let's go, hassle, let's go get some food. Don't read, you don't have time to read. And, uh, and that is why I think what they are doing, uh, First Lady is doing is wonderful, getting people to read. Barbara Holland's new book, Hail to the Chiefs, offers little known and quirky anecdotes of presidential behavior from George Washington to the present. She tells of a president who was drunk at his inauguration and other stories. This is 40 Minutes. Uh, good evening. I'm Barbara Mead. We're going to have an evening of two Barbaras tonight, Barbara Mead and Barbara Holland. I've been a Barbara Holland watcher for a long time, so I know that we have a very entertaining evening ahead of us. Uh, <laughs> no, I can never oversell Barbara Holland. Uh, she has the distinction of being 
um, a female curmudgeon. Most of the uh, people of the species tend to be male, but she is a very, very special female curmudgeon, and she has a very timely book in this month of presidential birthdays of, of an alternative presidential history. Uh, I figured that who else but Barbara Holland could make up a line like for President Pierce that he was the hero of many long fought bottles. Uh, uh, one of uh, many of our presidents, I think. Uh, Barbara Holland will talk for about 20 minutes. She'll take questions and then she'll sign. Thanks for coming. Hello. <laughs> I thank you all for coming out on this very sloppy night under orange alert, and I think you're all very brave and good to come. <laughs> and uh, I am afraid that you have been lured here under false pretenses. I feel that I should say that the subtitle, Presidential Mischief, Morals, and Malarkey, was my publisher's idea. And he was hoping that you would all think there'd be some really spicy sex stories in here that you hadn't heard before. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say that, uh, no, as a matter of fact, I actually debunk a couple of spicy sex stories. And I do not think that James Buchanan was homosexual. And uh, it is mostly just about who the presidents were as people and some of what they did when they were presidents. And uh, I... I'm afraid that perhaps it is also a bit on the frivolous side. And in these solemn times, it is very wrong to be frivolous and to speak disrespectfully of anything in American history. But uh, one reviewer has even called it silly, and it might perhaps be considered a bit silly in parts. And this, too, of course, is very wrong in this day and age. And other reviewers have referred to it as a bathroom book. And actually, <laughs> It is a bathroom book, and I don't see why we can't be allowed to have a bathroom book about American history. If you take Henry Steele Commager into the bathroom with you and put him on your knees, you'll never stand up again. And <laughs> so it is a fairly lighthearted take, but I would like to think that most of it is true. At least I have checked most of it. And I wrote it because in high school I was bored blue with American history. I sat there waiting patiently. You had to take American history before you could take European history and get to the good stuff with the heads rolling in the gutters and the little princes and the towers and all those things. <coughs> and American history seemed to consist entirely of stout gentlemen in three-piece suits who sat around and talked about money, mostly. Uh, tariffs and taxes and the gold standard and things like that. And I am waiting for Marie Antoinette finally got to her. And decades and decades later, I was working for an advertising agency, and our biggest client decided there was an election coming up. Our biggest client decided that he wanted to run a get-out-the-vote campaign, a pro bono thing, with little known facts about the American presidents. So it was a slow day, and I boogied over to the library and opened a book at random, and I came across John Quincy Adams and a tale which all of you may have heard. He was a pioneer fitness man a long, long time ago. Never did a thing for his figure. He was always a rotund little fellow. But <coughs> every morning he went out and took a brisk walk along the Potomac River. And then he took off all his clothes and put them in a pile on the bank and went for a brisk swim, winter and summer, I gather, in the Potomac, which I see is partly frozen over at the moment. But <laughs> anyway, whether this was winter or summer, I do not know. But Turns out there was a lady reporter. Well, this was a long time ago for a lady reporter. And she'd been trying to get an interview with him, and he'd been turning her down. And the account, uh, she actually did exist. Her name was Anne Royal or Royale, and she was a piece of work, apparently. And it does not say anywhere that she'd been stalking him. It just implies that she was going out also for a little stroll along the banks of the Potomac in the morning. And there is the bald head of our 
president above the waters of the Potomac, and there are his clothes on the bank, and she sat down on them and <laughs> stayed there until uh, he gave her the interview. He didn't have much choice. I have not been able to find the interview. I would love to find it. <laughs> <coughs> And when I got back to the office, it turned out that the client had changed his mind. And he's not going to do the campaign after all. And I thought, well, shoot, this is a waste. There must be all sorts of funny stories out there. So I decided to write the book without the advertising campaign. And it has been very interesting. In fact, it has been great fun. And you look back over these 43 presidents, and you think, what a motley crew. You, impossible to imagine that all these chaps were actually doing the same job. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And then you say to yourself, all right, who was good and who was bad? Who were our great presidents and who were our terrible presidents? And you come to the conclusion that about 98% of it is luck and timing. Whether you have voted for a man with experience and credentials and character and principles and all those things or not really doesn't have much to do with it besides luck and timing. And, of course, every four years we have an election. And on Wednesday morning, half the country figures that it means the end of civilization as we know it. And the other half feels that... Uh, Utopia is right around the corner, and happy days are here again, and they're both wrong, of course. It's all luck and timing, and all you can do is keep your fingers crossed. If you <coughs> look at those three lads in the 1860s, for instance, James Buchanan and a hapless Andrew Johnson, and in between, Abraham Lincoln, our great American hero, and Buchanan and Johnson are pretty much neck and neck for the worst presidents ever. <laughs> and with our great hero in between, Buchanan didn't stop the Civil War from happening. All the states went right ahead and seceded, and he didn't stop them. And then Lincoln comes along. The war is all ready to roll, so you can't very well blame him for the war. And then we won, depending on which side of the Mason-Dixon line you live on, we either won or lost. But anyway, the war was successfully concluded, and five days after it was over, Lincoln is dead as a duck. And who gets the aftermath? Poor Andrew Johnson, who is, well, I think really he's, he's out there, uh, wins by a nose for our worst president ever. And one of our rather few presidents to be impeached, though uh, he did squeak by with one vote. And... Everyone blamed him for Reconstruction. It was not his fault. He had radical co uh, Republicans in Congress, and they were going to punish the South till it screamed. There were many responsible people in Congress who said that every white male in the South over the age of 14 should be hanged without a trial and no questions asked. Johnson was trying to be as even-handed and fair as he could. But there was nothing he could do about it. He gets blamed for it. Buchanan gets blamed for the thing starting in the first place. And Lincoln is a hero because all he had was the war. He didn't have to deal with anything else. It's all done with luck and timing. So uh, that is about really all I can say looking back over all this. It's, uh, it is, I suppose you might call it a crapshoot. And... By and large, most of our presidents have managed to rise to the occasion. We haven't, looking back on it, you know, had any presidents who really thoroughly dropped the ball. Most of them, we haven't had any Neville Chamberlains. Most of them have managed to rise to the occasions as the occasions happened. I mean, you take a president who has been reviled as a draft dodger and called a usurper, and then, well, an unfortunate occurrence happens, and he gets to stand up and become a war leader and uh, pledge to stamp out evil all over the world wherever it lurks and bring back Osama dead or alive and he becomes a hero uh, which is nice for him because if it hadn't people might still be talking about who actually won the election which would be rather a bore by now and it's been a long long time <coughs> and the really great thing about it all looking back 
is the sheer glorious variety of it. The greatest glory of our system is its dazzling variety. Like snowflakes and fingerprints, no two presidents are exactly alike, and most are totally, amazingly different. Given our national attention span, this is just as well. Every four or eight years, we get somebody new to watch. If we voted for him, we watch to see if he's going to prove us wrong. If we voted against him, we watch to see if he's going to prove us right. We watch his goings out and his comings in, his children, his dogs, his wife. If the sun shines and the armies win, we cheer him. If the stock market hits the fan and hurricanes rage, we hiss and boo. If the times are boring, he bores us. He's our national sponge, chosen by the people to absorb the national moods and happenings. He's only a few moves away from the ancient scapegoat that soaked up our sins and troubles and then carried the boy into the desert. Eight years later, at most, he disappears into the wilderness, leaving us cleansed and righteous and ready to match the next. Imagine having to listen to Castro's speeches for 40 years. Imagine living in a monarchy. If the times are peaceful and you get yourself a young and healthy king, you could be watching the same first family for 50 years. You would see his children born, go to school, grow up, and have children of their own, and by then you'd know more about them than you did about your own children. His Majesty's portrait would be hanging on the classroom walls for generations. With luck, he'd get in a scrape occasionally, perhaps even have a mistress to keep you awake for the evening news, but ba basically it's the same fellow. When he finally dies, nobody gets to guess who's next. His eldest son succeeds, and you've been hearing about this prince for as long as you can remember, and nothing he does is going to surprise you. Americans would never stand for this. Even 16 years of George III was too much to bear. However exciting a president may be, eight years of the same show is plenty. We are not natural monogamous, monogamous here. Americans pine for fresh fields and pastures new, different clothes in the White House closets, and somebody else to think about. Sometimes the process coughs up a hairball. Sometimes events overpower a perfectly decent fellow. But the system gives us chance after chance after chance, and always we keep our eye on the horizon, waiting to see who's next. The Founding Fathers invented a glorious game. <coughs> and I think we should go back and check out everybody's favorite president, Millard Fillmore. Many people are almost indifferent to the subject of Millard Fillmore. It's his name. They think if they'd known a kid in school named Millard, he wouldn't have been a barrel of laughs, but they're just guessing. Millard was his mother's maiden name, though I admit that's a pretty thin excuse. And actually, he named his own son Millard, and I can't think of any excuse for that. <coughs> Excuse me. He wasn't a bad man. In fact, he was quite nice. He was just wrong a good deal of the time. He couldn't help it. The only right thing he did was be born in a log cabin. <clears throat> See also Jackson, Taylor, Buchanan, Lincoln, and Garfield. <clears throat> Cynics believe they were all born in the same log cabin, <clears throat> rented out for the purpose to ambitious mothers by real estate entrepreneurs. <laughs> this is probably not true. His family was very poor and indentured him to a wool carter and cloth dresser. And being indentured wasn't at all the same as being apprenticed. It was much nastier. By the time he finally bought his freedom and got to school, he was a big boy, 19 years old, and fell in love with the teacher. They waited for each other for seven years while he clerked in a law office and then set up his own practice. It wasn't what you'd call a classical education, but don't forget he could card wool and dress cloth, too. He wasn't interested in politics until the anti-Masonic party came along. At the time, everyone got very excited about the Masons and the anti-Masons, because a bricklayer named Morgan had disappeared, and some hysterical types said that the Masons had done him in. In the 19th century, whenever anything happened, the bystanders got together and formed a political party about it. For alternate entertainment, they could read the Bible or rub goose grease into their boots. <laughs> Millard went to the New York State Assembly as an anti-Mason. It was the wrong thing to be, naturally. Everything he did was wrong. Presently, he found himself in Congress, and one day in 1848, the Whigs were looking around for a vice presidential type to run with Taylor, and their eye lit on Millard. They thought he'd help them carry New York. 
Besides, he had nice blue eyes and a deep voice, and was modest and handsome, and a Capricorn. And what more do you want, her vice president? He may look a bit jowly to you, and it's true that if his waistcoat were larger, it wouldn't strain at the buttons like that. But in 1850, nobody cried shame to a middle-aged man who put on a few pounds, or they or told him to count his cholesterol. They thought it looked much more dignified than poor little pulp floating around loose in his oversized suits. Anyway, it was a perfectly acceptable choice. Who could know Taylor was going to overdose on cold milk? In July of 1850, of course, everybody does remember about poor, unfortunate Zachary Taylor, who went out to the mall to celebrate the 4th of July and got very hot and sweaty and came back to the White House and drank so much cold milk, and some people say cold cherries, too, and uh, died. There were a lot of different theories about his death, uh, dysentery, cholera, whatnot, and nobody was quite sure, but anyway, there was Miller Fillmore, president of the United States. And he hit his stride at being wrong. For starters, he gave the wrong answer to the slavery question. By this time, there was no right answer. I keep losing my place. He thought slavery was a terrible idea, personally. He'd been indentured, and that was no picnic either. But he said the states were old enough to decide for themselves. He was a peaceable fellow and hoped to stop the Civil War from happening. 500,000 Americans died in it, compared to a mere 400,000 in World War II, and it cost around 20 billion, just the kind of thing he hated. It was also a mistake to try to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, under which runaway slaves were returned to their owners like a lost earring or the Steinway Grand caught hightailing it up the road. This was not only wrong, it was impossible. Another idea he had was opening up world trade. He sent Commodore Perry to Japan. Of course, everybody here knows about Pacific Overtures and how it gave, how this man gave Stephen Sondheim the chance to rhyme Fillmore and Stillmore. President's film, Fillmore, still more glad. <laughs> By means of the heavily armed frigates Mississippi and Susquehanna, that they buy things from us. And the Japanese hadn't spoken to anyone at all for hundreds of years. They liked it that way. They were perfectly happy alone on their island, eating sushi and kicking each other in the ear and having tea ceremonies. Sometimes for excitement, his loved ones would try to poison the emperor, but mostly life just jogged along. And Millard's idea was that with a little arm twisting, they'd eventually end up with an island full of Pontiacs and RCA stereos, and Wayne would end up with a vault full of yen. His whole career was like that. When the Japanese finally said yes, we gave them a barrel of whiskey and a copy of Audubon's Birds of America. I expect they were terribly pleased. His other international triumph was about Peruvian guano. Guano is a substance deposited by seabirds on rocks and offshore islands and park benches, and people used it for fertilizer. Millard intervened between the Peruvians and some squabbling American businessmen and negotiated a treaty so we could import more guano. Then everyone started using miracle Grow instead. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why the reviewer called it silly. Mrs. Fillmore wasn't feeling well, but she did notice that there wasn't anything in the house to read, not even a dictionary. She'd been a school teacher, so she sent word to Congress that there ought to be some books around the place and got an appropriation for sets of Dickens and Thackeray. She still felt lousy, but at least she had something to read. I've been told that she also installed the first White House bathtub, but if so, then what was Van Buren lolling around in? A soup kettle? You can't believe everything you read. <laughs> Miller had his domestic side. He called the White House his temple of inconveniences and ordered a fancy great patented cook stove with all the modern Im improvements in valves and flues and drafts and a clever place to keep the ashes. Even that was wrong. The cook ignored it completely and went right on using the open fireplace and getting ashes in the soup. In 1852, the Whigs decided Millard was the wrong president and flatly refused to nominate him. His feelings were so hurt that he joined the Know Nothing Party, a group that claimed to know nothing about what it was doing and believed that only people who were born here and Protestants should be allowed to vote or get pre elected or hold any nice jobs or have any fun at all. He ran for president on the Know Nothing ticket in 56, and he carried Maryland. He still thought there shouldn't be any civil war, so he wouldn't support Lincoln. So his remaining friends stopped speaking to him. After that, he moved to Buffalo, New York, and as far as anyone knows, he was happy as a clam there, and nobody noticed that he was wrong. When his wife died, he married a rich widow and got elected the very first president of the Buffalo Historical Society, and they thought he was a perfectly swell president. Is there anyone else, anybody else here that you'd like to hear about? Would you like to hear about poor James Garfield, or, hey, you know, sometimes, you get a vice president that you didn't really mean to have because you thought he was only going to be a vice president, 
and he ends up as president because many presidents, even if they look perfectly young and healthy, turn out to be rather fragile. And everybody thinks it's the end of the world. But uh, people were quite hysterical when, General, when poor Garfield got shot. It was very sad. He was shot in the back. He'd only been president for a few months. And handsome, scholarly gentleman. He was great. But <clears throat> he had a vice president named Chester Arthur. And Garfield lingered for months and months all summer long, and everybody was pray praying hysterically for his life because they thought Chester Arthur would mean the end of civilization as we know it. That didn't. Sometimes things turn out better than you think. Nobody knows, that, knows what got into Chester Arthur. He'd always been considered a political bottom feeder from the darkest, siltiest depths, and seemed perfectly happy that way. He was the contented tool of Senator Roscoe Conkling, the man to know if you wanted a job in New York. And he never run for public office, since you didn't need to do anything that strenuous if you knew Roscoe Conkling. Conkling, actually, was one of the chums that Grant shouldn't have taken up with. Army life didn't prepare a person for Conklings. Arthur wasn't even a Civil War veteran like everyone else. As Conkling's friend, he'd spent the war cozy as a worm in an apple being quartermaster general in New York. Besides, though he always said he was born in Vermont, rumor had it that his mother, unmindful of the future, had strayed over the line into Canada before she went into labor, meaning he couldn't be president anyway. And nobody except Roscoe Conkling wanted him to be. All summer, everyone prayed hysterically for Garfield's health. Rutherford B. Hayes wrote in his diary that Garfield's death would be a national calamity. Arthur for president, conkling the power behind the throne, superior to the throne. The nation referred to Arthur's political origins as a mess of filth. And it was right, too. Peavy's feelings were hurt. He spent 80 days hanging around waiting and reading the papers and listening to people pray for Garfield. And maybe he took it to heart and repented. He had Bright's disease, too, though he never let on about it, and maybe that helped. Whatever happened, he turned into an acceptable and honest president and scarcely gave Conkling the time of day. Everyone was surprised, especially Conkling. He was more than surprised. He was beside himself. <clears throat> Furthermore, he supported the Pendleton Act of 83, which said that people could take civil service exams for a lot of jobs and then keep the jobs no matter who got elected, freeing up future presidents to do something besides appoint postmasters. This made all the key people perfectly wild with rage, since handing out jobs had been a great way to make friends and get presents and votes and surprising envelopes full of money and pay folks for favors past and future, as nobody knew better than Chester Arthur. His old friends thought he had lost his mind. Arthur was a widower, his wife, <coughs> his wife Nell having died the year before. He was considered a handsome dog, which goes to show how styles change and sported the most amazing tuffets of grayish woolly mustachios and side whiskers as if he'd been trying to eat a sheep without peeling it. <laughs> he was also one of our nattiest dressers since Van Buren and his New York tailor, uh, one of our nattiest dressers since Van Buren and his New York tailor had to hire extra help just to keep up with the White House orders. So Ramsey called for 20 coats at a clip. The first thing he did in the White House was redecorate. He called the place a badly kept barracks and went to live with Senator Jones in Nevada and sent for Louis Comfort Tiffany to fix things up. 24 wagon loads of leaky cuspidors, battered hair mattresses, priceless antiques, and moth-eaten carpets got hauled off and sold at auction, and Tiffany went to work. Everything that could have fringes on it had fringes on it, and everything else was painted gold. As far as the eye could see, there was red velvet and plush and floral embroidery, decorated screens, friezes, sconces, cabbage rose wallpapers, and enormous painted urns. It was simply gorgeous. Then he moved in and started giving the grandest possible dinner parties, at which everyone ate and drank as much as they could pack in for two or three hours. Arthur's cheeks got quite rosy and stayed that way. One school of thought calls him a terrible flirt, while another says nonsense. He grieved constantly for his lost wife, Nell. The latter cite as evidence that he had the service, servants put fresh flowers daily beside her photograph. But I'm not sure that signifies. He had flesh, fresh flowers put daily on every flat surface in the house. He grew over a hundred different kinds of roses in the conservatory and sent to New York for some truly breathtaking floral centerpieces for his dinners. Besides, if he was so faithful and grief-stricken, how do you explain Pepita's daughter? Pepita, who preferred to be described as a dancing girl, was such a dear friend of the second Lord Sackville that they had seven children together. 
One of the daughters, Victoria, went to Washington to be her father's hostess at the British Legation. Queen Victoria, who wasn't the prude you think she was, said it was all right with her, if it was all right with Washington. And Washington said it didn't see anything wrong with the idea. Lionel Sackville West was rather a stick, and Washington felt that anyone would improve his parties. He was described as having an unusual power of silence. She was only 19 and a real peach and charmed everyone, including Chester Arthur. According to herself, he proposed and she, quote, burst out laughing and said, Mr. President, you have a son older than me and you are as old as my father. This left her free to marry her cousin, the third Lord Sackville, and produce Vita Sackville West and famous chum of Virginia Woolf and all that crowd. The White House issued a formal denial of the whole story as who wouldn't. When Arthur's name was mentioned at the Republican convention, no cheers went up. Politicos were still pretty ticked about the Pendleton Act and got not getting to pass out jobs, and they liked Blaine better anyway. Arthur didn't pursue the matter. His Bright's disease was creeping up on him. We now know that there's no such thing as Bright's disease, but whatever it was, it was creeping up on him. <laughs> and he had a fine time while it lasted with all that good food and wine and pretty ladies and enough coats and suits to last several lifetimes. Not to mention the shock he'd given Roscoe Conkling, which must have been good for many a quiet chuckle under the sheep's wool. <laughs> Anyone else you would like to hear about? Do you, would, would you like to hear how Franklin Pierce may or may not have been drunk when he fell off that horse? <laughs> that was... The hero of many a well-fought bottle is not my line. Uh, that was what his, <clears throat> his comrades in arms called him. <coughs> and he said that he wasn't drunk, that actually his horse reared up and that the pommel grabbed him in the groin and naturally he fainted from the pain and he fell off the horse and then the horse fell down and broke his leg and the horse was sober too and that was his story. <laughs> However, it is true that when he was in the White House, he did get arrested for riding over an old lady on horseback. And when the cop realized who he stopped, he uh, apologized and let him go. And he may have been perfectly sober, for all anyone knows, but none of our other presidents have ridden over any old ladies on a horse. <laughs> any questions? Yeah? Which presidents do you think have gone the furthest in terms of compromising democratic uh, liberties? I remember the stories about Nixon and wanting to, uh, and how the Kissinger was concerned about that he might have a military coup. And I wonder whether any other presidents you can think of, and you can include Nixon too. <laughs> um, and that uh, comes and goes, and things do seem to rub. Uh, I mean, there was the Alien Sed and Sedition Act, for instance, way back in the beginning there, saying that you couldn't shoot your mouth off about the government, and uh, we seem to have gotten back to the First Amendment very nicely after that. And I, d I suppose with this long overview, you just get the feeling that uh, things do tend to work out in the long run. Of course, at the moment, we're all worried about the short run. <laughs> but if we could just take a long view about these things, and also remember not to express any unpatriotic sentiments in public at the moment because this is a wartime emergency. <laughs> Bob. Uh, during your research and writing, was there any particular present president that you acquired uh, uh, affection and sympathy for? Actually, along the way, most of them while I was working on them, uh, who did I get to feel? Except George Washington. You know, it was very hard to get to feeling affectionate about George Washington. There's just something about him that just doesn't warm the cockles of the heart. Though, of course, I think Grant. I think Grant really, really got a bum. I don't think he got rich off any of those scandals in his administration because he simply wasn't that kind of a guy, and everybody else got rich, and he got poor. And as for poor Harding... You know, there are a lot of people in here who never really wanted to be president. Taft didn't want to be president. Grant didn't want to be president. When Grant was still fighting the Civil War, people came to him and said, you can be president if you want. You can be, call yourself the people's president. And Grant said, I have but one ambition. When this war is over, I am going to go back to Galena, Ohio, and run for mayor. And if I am elected, I am going to have the sidewalk fixed up between my house and the depot. 
And then what? He's president, poor man. He didn't like it. He wasn't very good at it. But he was a real crabs of a general. I'm... Yes, I, th I, th I think I got fondest of Grant reading about it. He was a nice, nice man, and those scandals were not his fault. He didn't even know what they were all about. What did he know from money? He was a career army. <coughs> yeah? Who were the most naturally funny or witty? Naturally funny or witty? Clinton. <laughs> Uh, Lincoln. Now, it's true that Lincoln was quoting a lot of pretty old hairy jokes, uh, considering the Internet wasn't even around at the time. He really knew some old ones, but Lincoln could be pretty funny. Because he was an extremely melancholy and depressed man, and I think a lot of the greatest wits and humorists are melancholy and depressed. So that wouldn't hold for Clinton, but then Lincoln was probably funnier than Clinton. <laughs> How easy was it to dig up these gems during a period when the press was so much more protective of the president than they are now? Uh, yes and no. There was a long period when the press was very protective of the presidents. I mean, those of people who were living in Washington during the Eisenhower administration didn't have a clue that Mamie was drinking sherry till noon all morning. And, and <laughs> but uh, back in the olden, olden days, the, the presidential candidates and the president did not say much of anything. They let their supporters do it. It would have been undignified for them, for instance, to run for office. But man, their supporters really put their backs there. They all bought their own newspapers and printed any, and they called them heavens. They called them bastards and traffickers with the devil and, and traitors. And of course, they were making up most of it. And you really have to be rather careful and touch it with tongues. But there was a lot of interesting dirt out there. It was political, though. I mean, nobody went after anybody's sex life or anything. I mean, hey, if Clinton had been a president before they invented body wires and phone taps, who would know anything about his sex life either? And besides, it just wasn't considered relevant. But as for their political opinions, man, they pulled all the stops out. <laughs> and I. Yes, a lot of biographers, more scholarly biographers with more time than I have had, have managed to dig up a number of little tidbits about, you know, how they played with their children and that sort of thing. That if you, if you, people wrote a lot of letters. There were tons and mountains and mountains and mountains of letters. And nobler and more patient souls than I have gone through them and extracted things from them. What about the modern presidents? What kinds of information do you have about them in your book that, that perhaps is about uh, elsewhere? Could there possibly be the tiniest scrap of information about them that we don't have? <laughs> uh, I don't think I've uncovered anything new about the new boys. Uh, unless those of us living in Washington really thought that uh, uh, President Kenny was faithful to his wife or anything like that. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff one knew in Washington. I mean, even as a child, I knew that Mamie Eisenhower drank, but we just uh, didn't, this stuff didn't really leak out beyond the district line very much. And uh, let's see, Gerald Ford had a dog named Spot, but then I believe Bush has a dog named Spot, too. And um, I had fun watching old Ronald Reagan movies, but no, the newer presidents, I'm sure I don't really have anything here that's going to startle any Washingtonians. Yeah? Go back and tell us a little about Mr. Buchanan and his, <laughs> quote, sex life or lack thereof. He is widely considered to be, well, not widely, but by a, you know, the usual wing nuts, considered to have been homosexual because he was our only bachelor president. Now, long before he was president, he was engaged to a very nice girl, and they had a fight. And she gave him back his ring and went home and committed suicide. Now, there may be many um, 
sturdier types who wouldn't have paid any attention or would have gotten over it and gotten married, but apparently he just never quite recovered from it. And he carried his neck a little funny, and a lot of people were saying that he had tried to hang himself after she committed suicide, which is not true. He carried his neck funny because he was nearsighted in one eye and farsighted in the other eye, and it was the only way he could even try to focus on you by carrying his neck funny. <coughs> and, and he really, really had a lousy road to hoe, and no, he was unable to stop the South from seceding, and, but as far as I know, his sex life was blameless. You know, everybody considers that nowadays that everybody must have some sort of sex, li sex life, and if you don't know about it, you must be keeping it a deep, dark secret. But it may even be that uh, some people just didn't find it necessary. <laughs> is because there's been a story around you might have must have heard of it that he was living when he was before he became president he was living with a man who was a known homosexual oh i never heard that no i haven't where'd you get it i don't even remember but I, <laughs> it was here he was here in washington and uh, uh -huh. and he was apparently living with someone who was a known homosexual and that's what started the stories as far as I how come he was a known homosexual way back then i mean was he wearing a dress <laughs> It just wasn't the kind of thing people talked about much back then. <laughs> Maybe he was simply living with another bachelor, which would seem reasonable enough. <laughs> it, was, it was not a public, popular subject of conversation. And, of course, there are always said to be secrets out there. There's Lincoln's sex life, for instance, which we do not know about and probably never will. His law partner, Herndon, who wrote his bi Lincoln's biography, had, it is said, had a big fat folder of, uh, he had come out right out and said that Lincoln was one hell of a man for the ladies, and a big fat folder full of various allegations about Lincoln, some of which may have been true and some of which may have been false. Man had a lot of enemies. It was said that he had had a premarital relation with a prostitute which gave him syphilis, and many other things which we do not know because amazingly enough, Herndon did not get a book contract and did not publish any of this, and nobody knows where these notes got to. We just know that they existed. And, and that a few people who had seen them were horrified and outraged. This, again, we only have as a rumor. So if anyone here, you know the public has a right to know all these things, and if anyone here knows where these notes are on Lincoln's sex life, you'd better don't, uh, I should say, ooh, Eight or ten million from a major publisher, but you want to put it up at auction. Yes. Or uh, you could just have a novel in very fine print at the back somewhere and pretend that you had the actual stuff. <laughs> heard from any of the president's descendants about the, of the scandalous information you've imparted in the book? No, no. Uh, um, no, I haven't. <laughs> I want to thank Barbara Holland once again. Um, we learned of uh, a different kind of American history tonight, which is important. We, uh, we know now that what they taught us in school was not everything that there was to know. <laughs> uh, again, if people will help fold the chairs, uh, uh, Barbara Holland will sit here and she'll sign. And thank you again for coming. Washington, D.C. native Barbara Holland is a reporter, columnist, and author of several books. Her latest is Hail to the Chiefs, Presidential Mischief, Morals, and Malarkey from George W. to George W. It's published by Permanent Press, online at thepermanentpress.com. Monday is President's Day, and you're watching a three-day weekend of books on Book TV. Coming up at 4 p.m. Eastern, Traverse the history of stock market booms and busts with CNBC's Ron Insana, author of Trend Watching. Then former SEC Chairman Arthur Levitt. Take It on the Street is his primer on protecting individual investors from 
corporate fraud. Tonight on History on Book TV, Andrew Linklater examines Thomas Jefferson's role in creating the American system of measurement. After that, a foreign policy discussion with authors Walter Russell Mead, Paul Bluestein, Joseph Nye Jr., and Samantha Power. And at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, a book party for Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, author of Square Peg. Is Einstein's theory of special relativity wrong? Theoretical physicist Joao Magezu says yes in his new book, Faster Than the Speed of Light. He details his rejection of Einstein's theory today on Book TV. First, you'll watch as Pages Magazine editor Beth Ann Patrick interviews the author for an upcoming profile article. That'll be followed by a talk at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. Joao Magezu questions the foundation of modern physics beginning at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. It just became clear to me that Europeans were looking at the world and had a sense of what international order should be like uh, that was rather strikingly different from the American perspective. Tonight on C-SPAN's Book Notes, Robert Kagan on the future of U.S. foreign policy, of paradise and power, America versus Europe in the New World Order. Book Notes, one author, one book, one hour, every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. One of my favorite sidebars in the book is on page 192, and it's called All in the Family. Thank you. And it's uh, um, about the incredible close ties between <laughs> Washington lobbyists and Washington elected officials. So when I say close ties, I mean really close. I mean like sleeping together or being offspring. Linda Daschle, for example, married to Tom Daschle, chief lobbyist for American Airlines. <laughs> And is there any surprise that the Democratic leadership did not fight the massive multi-billion dollar bailout of the airline industry immediately after September 11th, indeed passed it incredibly quickly without any provisions for workers? That was the stunning thing, a $15 billion bailout package that did not inclu include any protections for workers and that in fact was followed by massive layoffs and bankruptcies. So when the president of the State of the Union stands up and celebrates the fact that he's going to give $450 million to mentor children of prisoners and other children, the question is $450 million for this huge social problem compared to $15 billion for a bailout of an industry that had been looking for this bailout long before September 11th and that, like many other industries, used September 11th to get what they wanted. And just as an aside, mentoring the children of prisoners, many of whom are there because of the most misguided drug laws in this country, that have 500,000 nonviolent drug offenders in jail. I know that's an aside, but you know, public policy has massive implications. And of course, part of my own transformation from being a moderate Republican, I was always moderate on the social issues, to being a populist progressive, because I haven't become a Democrat and I haven't become um, somebody on the traditional left, because I think a lot of these left-right uh, distinctions are so obsolete. But one of my, uh, one of the things that most pushed me in that direction was the fact that really we cannot deal with these massive social problems through the private sector alone, or even through the private sector predominantly, a, because we need the raw power of government appropriations, and B, because we need the government's watchdog role. And that's really what we've lost. We've lost this oversight capacity that government institutions have over the free market. And I want to start by making clear that although we talk about corporate scandals, and although I talk about pigs at the trough, at their heart, these scandals are political scandals. Greed has always existed. You know, we're not going to end greed. And corporate scandals have always existed. What makes the, the ones we, we are going through right now, because this morning in the papers we had global crossing again, the, the, the degree to which senior ex execs defrauded their investors turns out to be even more blatant than we thought. And so the fact that all these scandals went on throughout the 90s and are continuing now and we're allowing them to continue is because of the fact 
that so much of government, so much of public policy is now paid for by lobbies in the interest of corporate America. And you know, that sounds simple, but it's so fundamentally true that I have so many dozens of examples here, but let me just give you two. The Homeland Security Bill that was passed um, at, the, at the last Congress included two provisions which should have taken us to the streets. One of them was the Eli Lilly provision that gave Eli Lilly um, a multi-billion dollar giveaway protection from lawsuits from parents claiming that their children became autistic because of a mercury additive in an Eli Lilly vaccine. Now, this, A, had absolutely nothing to do with Homeland Security, right? And B, was introduced into the bill in the 11th hour without anybody taking authorship. And you know, this is a town where everybody's clamoring to take credit for everything, but not for the Eli Lilly provision. And the other provision, which is equally outrageous, was to um, reverse the ban on corporations that had moved to tax havens receiving government contracts. I want to see how Ari Fleischer, because nobody asks the president many questions, but Ari Fleischer on the president's behalf could justify at the time of war and supposedly shared sacrifice having American corporations not paying taxes and yet getting taxpayer money in the form of government contracts. An upcoming program on C-SPAN 2's Book TV. At the top of the hour, CNBC's Ron and Sana on trend watching. But first, a look at the record-breaking sale of Shakespeare's first folio. On October 8, 2001, Christie's Auction House in New York City sold part of the library of rare book collector Abel Burland. Book TV cameras were there to capture the sale of a 1623 first folio of Shakespeare's plays. The final price set a record for a book of Shakespeare's works. What is a first folio? First folio is the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. And it's been called the first folio because of its size. It's a large format. A folio is the size of the binding, and that's how it's become known as the first folio of Shakespeare. It's really the first collected edition of his plays. And this copy is estimated to sell for two to three million dollars. Two to three million. This is the this is the this is this the cornerstone of Abel Berlin's collection. Shakespeare's where it all started for him. He's the most important author for Abel and for many other people in the world. And um, this, of all the books, warrants the estimate. It's it's extremely rare in private hands. Complete this copy has all its leaves genuine, and uh, that's a that's unusual. The book was read to death, and although a lot of copies survive of it. Most of them are very incomplete and imperfect. So for a perfect copy in, a, in an early binding, an 18th, uh, 17th, late 17th century binding, is, is, this is the, the only complete copy in an early binding in private hands. And not inconsistent with prices paid for other first folios. That's right. There's when a history they, when, they, when they've come up before, although not often. Um, the last copy in an early binding came up 16 years ago. Yeah. Um, so that's not frequent, but it but uh, it gives us some idea of where it would be in today's market. We have to you know, extrapolate a little bit on the value, but it certainly uh, is a multi-million dollar book. This was printed after Shakespeare's death. Can you yeah. explain a little bit the history of, of how why it was printed and how it was, it was published collected? In six, yeah, it was published in 1623, uh, and the King's Men were really the, the group that Shakespeare, the actors, got together after he died realizing how important his works were and uh, wanted to get a very accurate text published of his great works and they really painstakingly went through carefully making sure that the copies that they either had or they had circulated were as accurate as possible so it was a very exactly. very carefully uh, put together production very two, two of his former players in the king's men uh, uh, hemming and Con condell and they were they were the two there's a statue erected to them in England. Uh, imagine that to, pu to a publisher. But they gave us Shakespeare. Also, yeah. was a monograph written about Hemming and Condell. Uh, yeah. They, they, there were other, there were uh, what 26 uh, plays of Shakespeare that were in print 
in what would they say fair quarter a bad quarter is good quarter yeah, the, qual the quality, the quality the accuracy textually uh, so i mean there, there were printed versions of some of the plays but never a complete edition of his collected works and so what they did and not, not only did they decide to do a collected edition of his works but to use and as they say as hemming and condell say in here to according to the true original copies yeah. well, one wonders you know did they use shakespeare's manuscript uh, copies because nothing survives in Shakespeare's hand other than nine signatures. That's yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Uh, nothing in his hand. We only know Shakespeare through the printed word. Very and, interesting. And very interesting point to uh, to make. We don't know him through anything that survives in his hand. To go back to your question earlier, what do I feel when I pick up something like this? This is as close as I can get to William Shakespeare. Uh, you know, and, 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 and a, in an artifactual way. And for 18 of the plays, this is the first time that they were published. So we would not have Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet or Macbeth. Romeo and Juliet, The Tempest. We're not for the first folio edition. So it's, just, it's historically important that it preserved Shakespeare to, to, to this day. Why were there no manuscripts preserved? Well, they would have been used and circulated among the players and um, they were probably it was a very ephemeral process i mean the playwright would write them modern scholarship them was modern scholarship they didn't have the same sense uh, of preservation that we have or that people would routinely copy so they would there's a f very quick story oxford university had a first folio and when they got a third they discarded their first they sold it to a bookseller and then it showed up remarkably years later and a, a very hefty price was paid to secure it back for Oxford University, but people just didn't keep things when they were replaced by others. And by his, other his later significance things. and importance grew over time, and it was, you know, after oh. after the fact, unfortunately, that that it was put together. You think it's possible someday somebody will open a trunk somewhere and find <laughs> I a, a I'd love to say yes. Um, <laughs> that would be some There's certainly no dearth of people looking. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's been just to get scraps or a signature um, is is a is a momentous event. You're not likely uh, to find a manuscript, but they have found various works that, that purported minor works right. that have been purportedly is a good word attributed to them. Yeah. And who will be looking for this book at the sale? That's a very tough. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Call because I mean it could be somebody who has no real experience buying rare book books or collecting rare books. It could be somebody who loves Shakespeare. It could be somebody who is either involved in entertainment or acting or, I mean, exactly. Shakespeare is so universal and universally loved throughout the world. I mean, this is, this is a book that could have appealed to somebody who has never bought a rare book. What's before. really exciting I mean, about this cycle is, is the totally unexpected and the unknown. It could be somebody none of us have ever heard of before, that's right. but somebody that has the wherewithal and the means and the interest uh, to acquire it. Yeah. We know it will go to somebody who... We know who the usual suspects are, maybe, but, but there's always somebody fresh and new that arrives, and in yeah. many cases, even might even dominate the sale. You never know. That's why we have to come and see what happens. The first folio of Shakespeare's plays. We can start the bidding on this at $1,300,000. $1,300,000 now to begin this. $1,400,000, $1,500,000. 1,600,000, million 1,700,000, 1,800,000, 1,900,000, 2,000,000, 2,000,000 dollars now, you're bid at 2 million. At 2 million dollars on my right. At 2 million dollars seated now. At 2 million dollars, 2 million, 2 million one, it's 2 million two. 2 million 200,000 will be next. Yeah, he came to the sale. Two million dollars. What do you want? Two three. Oh, yeah, that's even better. Two million three. Two million four. You get the discount. Two million four hundred thousand. Two million five. I'll take two million six hundred thousand. At two million six hundred thousand, we'll go. We'll go that way. Two million six hundred thousand. At two million six hundred thousand, it's in the room. Two million eight hundred thousand. You're welcome. Two million eight hundred thousand. I'll take two million nine. I announced it. Two million nine hundred thousand. Three million will be next. Two million nine hundred thousand. Two million nine hundred thousand dollars. Three million dollars. Three million two hundred thousand. We're gonna go by twos. Three million two hundred thousand. Three million four hundred thousand. Three million six hundred thousand. Three 
Three million eight hundred thousand, four million dollars. Four million two hundred thousand, four million four hundred thousand. Four million six hundred thousand, four million eight hundred thousand. Five million dollars. Five, we'll go by twos. Five million two hundred thousand. Five million four would be next. Is it five million two hundred thousand? Five million four hundred thousand. At five million four hundred thousand dollars. At five million four hundred, it's on the telephone now at five million four hundred thousand dollars. I'll go five million five hundred thousand. We'll take five million six, Maria. Five million five hundred thousand. Five million five hundred thousand. Five million six hundred thousand. Five million six hundred thousand. Then on the telephone now with Maria at five million six hundred thousand dollars. At five million six hundred thousand dollars. Anybody else at five million six hundred? Are we done? At five million six hundred thousand dollars. Final warning at five million six hundred. Sold. Five million six hundred thousand. Thank you. Nineteen oh three. Thank you. Lou, Lou Weinstein with Heritage Bookshop. That's correct. Um, you bid five and a half million dollars for a first folio, but you didn't get it. Are you trying to cheer me up? <laughs> That's correct. I mean, I, I bid uh, based on my best estimates on fair market value, but uh, it's hard to bid against the telephone. You don't know who's on the other side. But we certainly thought we had a very competitive bid, and uh, I think I was representing a client who'll probably be disappointed, but uh, you have to trust my judgment. And he did, and uh, I might not have bought it for eight million, so it's really not a factor. After five million dollars, somebody wants it. It's, it's on a different level. The last copy that, that sold was more like eight hundred thousand dollars, not comparable and some years ago, but the last set that sold through the rooms was uh, the four folders, so it's a million nine. And so uh, the market is very good. Do you have any idea who bought it? No, but when you find out, I'd really like to know. No. Uh, the purpose of bidding on the phone is to remain anonymous, and one really never knows unless they announce it later, and it's uh, unlikely it will be announced as far as I'm concerned. You did end up with a, a, a few some, other books. Oh, yeah. Uh, we bought uh, uh, a number of the Shakespeare folios and the Shakespeare poems and a book of ours. I mean, we, we spent uh, some significant mon funds, but... Uh, uh, there's certain books you sort of have your heart set on owning. I actually have the first folio in stock right now, but it's uh, uh, not nearly as uh, good at the, as this one. It's imperfect, and uh, I convinced my client not to buy the one I had and to buy the uh, one that was uh, coming up in the rooms, which was turned out many times more expensive. But uh, And I was right, except uh, my estimate was a little more conservative, I guess. Ron Insana has worked as a CNBC anchor throughout the stock market's boom and bust. Next on Book TV, he discusses trend watching, his new book chronicling investment bubbles through the ages. This talk from the Philadelphia Stock Exchange is 45 minutes. Thank you. Good morning. As soon as I get back to New York, I'll send Mr. Grasso your regards. Uh, <laughs> By the way, we bought these books. You can bring one back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to get into the, the, the contents of the book in a few minutes, but um, one of the things I like to, to do very frequently is, is talk about some of the stories that have shaped my thinking about markets and how I've gotten from uh, some of my original thoughts to, to points like this where I started looking at bigger picture items with respect to what happens on, on Wall Street and, and elsewhere around the country at the regional exchanges. And there's a great story that I picked up uh, many years ago about a specialist on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange by the name of John Coleman. He was one of the, the big characters back in the 1950s who used to walk the floor. And um, fortunately, in this crowd, I don't have to explain what a specialist is, but he was one of the big guys who made markets and stocks and had a variety of different positions, some proprietary, and obviously was matching buyers and sellers for a living. Um, and, and as I said, he was a grand character. He was a very proud individual. He had one of the best specialist firms on the floor, and along with Cardinal Spellman and the mayor of New York City back at the time, he 
helped to run New York City in something of a triumvirate. Uh, the fact that his initials were JC and that he was born on December 24th added to his self-image just a little bit. Um, but he was this proud character who uh, had a great business. Now, unfortunately for Mr. Coleman, he also had uh, in his employ a son-in-law who was uh, not the sharpest tool in the shed, as they like to say. And uh, as you guys know, back in the Back in the day, there were rules against eating on the floor of the various exchanges because people didn't want to slip on a, a dropped piece of food or on some spilled uh, beverage that might have been there. But the kid always kept something to drink at his side. And coincidentally, old man Coleman uh, not only made a market in Coca-Cola of New York, which was a regional bottling company at the time, but also held a proprietary stake in the firm that was somewhere uh, in the